Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pies Nation podcast, where the pies are hot and the drinks are cold. My name is Nicholas Sacco, your host for this week's episode, episode 12 of season 5, or episode 125. If you're counting from the beginning, you cannot wipe the smile, definitely off my face, but off all our faces after another victory over the Blues. No nail biters this time as we prevail by 28 points to claim win number six for the season and remain in our rightful place on top of the ladder. We have lots to discuss, including that Carlton win, some of our favourite steal moments as part of our Spies Nation in the lead up to his 300th game this week. Plus, we speak to our next guest, the crowd competition winner but before we get to all of that i've got a full studio right in front of me once again jack luke and marcus welcome to you all and mate i'm i'm laughing i'm smiling (laughs) this is the best you know how much i love it when we beat these guys and yeah just living the dream right now marcus thank you nico great to be back boys and give me more how about (laughs) that that? we had to get it all out i missed the memo (laughs) We had to get it all out today after his incredible performance yesterday. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a trifecta, not quite the quaddy, <laughs> thanks to Lukey, for Darcy Moore. But what a performance. We'll get to him, I'm sure, in plenty of detail. But truly a spectacular win. I, f- I feel like the game was done in almost a, qu- a quarter of footy and mm. we brought the heat and we didn't succumb to the umpires, oh. uh, who will also get to very, very shortly. Holding. As well. but, um, Kerno. Yeah, free kick Kerno. Free kick Kerno. That, that's almost the Monday headline. We'll get to the real Monday headline as well very shortly. <laughs> Nick, I'm pretty pumped with that. But it was a unique experience for me yesterday at the footy. Had the pleasure of meeting up with one Jack Dugs, oh, Dugan yep. and some illustrious crew in the uh, Percy Beams bar in the MCC, Nico. So we got the chance to share a beverage before the match, Jacko, and you had a, a nice quiet one the night before, which was fantastic. Yeah, nice uh, <laughs> quick jump into bed at four o'clock in the morning. So those two beverages went down a treat, Nico. But no, it was good to catch up with Marcus as always and even better to get the win. Nico, like you, I love beating these folks. So um, it is... A lot of fun doing it by one point, but I'll take an almost five goal win for sure. Level four for you and I, Lukey. We don't have to worry about going to the Percy Beams. Well, but you almost I'll, didn't even get a ticket. Well, what? I was standing in level one, so I, I got oh. myself down there but behind the Carlton Chew Squad as well. So I was a bit of a fun experience dealing with them. So Quick question, Lukey. Yeah. Was there anyone left at the final siren? <laughs> well, they were, I did. Uh, <laughs> I put a tweet out. 5.32, they were leaving. That's when that's, funny. that's when they start that's leaving. Funny. But honestly, I reckon a few were leaving before then. So, oh, a, yeah. sight, sight for sore eyes when they're just clearing out. <laughs> Nico, yeah. let's get straight into and it. If it had it been Opposition. our home game, I'm telling you, it would have been a lot more than eighty thousand. That's oh, for sure. Embarrassing, eighty thousand. Yeah. That's Jeez. pathetic. Yeah, exactly right. So get all the Pies fans in. You'll be a different story. Mm-hmm. But we've got plenty to look forward to on this week's episode. So let's dive right into it with the pie that caught your eye. All twenty three of them could have been. I reckon on Sunday after that win, but we'll try and pick one out. Jack, as always, we'll start with you. Yeah, all 23 could have been. Nico and I have gone the most obvious one, Darcy Moore. Um, He was unbelievable. Spoken about time and time again on the pod, how good his intercept marking is and his spring off halfback is and how important it is for our attack. Got to say, I was very nervous about this week. I thought coming up against two recent Coleman medalists um, in Harry Mackay and Charlie Curno was going to prove to be a bit of a challenge for Darcy especially considering the fact how small we looked um, down in the back line um, with Murph, Bruz, Quainer, you know, all having, and even Johnny Noble at times having to step up and play, you know, key defending roles. So not only for his ability to, um, yeah, essentially play somewhat of a lockdown role on those two boys, but also continue to play his natural game. I mean, he finished with 25 disposals, seven of them, them intercept possessions, um, and went an exceptional 84% efficiency by foot. So, oh, by foot and hand. So, yeah, I can't sing his praises high enough. It was exceptional. And they might try to take one mark away from him they to uh, claim the record, but yeah. that doesn't take away from his incredible performance. 12 marks, six of those contested, uh, 10 contested possessions as well. Eight rebound fifties, five tackles. Before we continue, mm. is that the best game from Darcy Moore you've ever seen? Recency bias always kicks in. Mm. I think there's a lot of matches where he's played like a forward in mm. defence, and it's something we marvel at mm. the fact that he's a mark first type of defender. But it's got to be up there. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he's best on ground and captain, perhaps mm. that adds another mm. layer to it against the old foe in the Blues. But 
fielding any other responses? No, I was going to say it's the most confident I've ever seen him out in the footy field. And we know in those early years, confidence confidence Mm. was a bit of an issue for him playing in that forward line. But yesterday, I've never seen him as confident as he was just running that back line and not always going for the mark, never going for the spoil and taking it at its highest point, I thought, yeah. So I, I would rate it up there with probably his best game of his career. Great call, Lukey. Yeah. Pilot caught your eye. Uh, Johnny Noble, I think he's going from strength to strength every week. He had 25 disposals at 80% efficiency. 18 kicks as well. I think he's as important of a player in our 22 as uh, most of the other guys out Ooh. there at the moment. So um, helping run that back line, the ball movement from defence to our forward transition, I think he's as important as anyone else out there for yeah. us at the moment. He looked composed, didn't he, with mm. ball in hand too. So that was a big factor into us getting that win. Marcus? Well, the pilot that caught my eye it was probably moment of the match. Ash Johnson taking oh. mark of the year. <laughs> Talk about yourself. Someone uh, <laughs> might have predicted that the, the week before. So manifesting with Marcus, we love that. But um, look, it was it was a highlight to say the least. He's, he's jumped on the tallest bloke from Carlton and landed on the tallest bloke from Collingwood and hurt himself in the process. So mm. uh, yeah, watching that from the wing and, and seeing him go up, it was, yeah, ouch. And I mean... I'm pretty happy with myself, but I think Ash Johnson was even happier with himself Mm. having a good look up at the replay screen. So well done to Ash. And if that doesn't come, you know, top three contenders, they do a Brownlow night still. Yeah, I believe so. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll eat this. Jumper, I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, so, anyway, Nico. Well, let's get the fans involved when it comes to that time of the year. Make sure there's plenty of votes in. Plenty of votes to ensure that he gets mark of the year. Um, tough one to pick because, obviously, Darcy Moore was exceptional and hard to go past. But I wanted Jordan Dugowie because it was another one of those games where it was mm. like, this wasn't a Dugowie-dominated game. But then you look in hindsight, 27 touches, a game-high seven score involvements, 13 contested possessions, five clearances, five inside fifties and him playing in this way and flying so much under the radar is doing nothing but good for this football club. I think for the pressure not to be on him to perform every single Mm. week because we have 22 contributors on the ground every time allows him to play his natural game by the looks of it. And he's been able to dominate. We ask for consistency from him. It's what we're getting there. There's been no scrutiny on his performances or, or the way he's been going about his football. And I just felt like, he was just playing his role, but to a point where it was having such a massive influence on the contest. It may not have seemed like it when we were watching at the time because we're too busy looking ahead and looking for all the goals mm. and, and for all the day cost touches, but for the goal to be playing the way he is right now is exceptional, and I don't think it can be understated how important he has been to this side over the first couple of months of the year. I'm sure you boys agree with his performances to date. Yeah, yep. absolutely. I was going to say absolutely, Nico. Even just watching the KO Mini um, on the way in just before, it sort of there was a few players highlighted where he was on the end of goal assists and, mm. you know, he's not hitting the scoreboard off his own boot, but he's setting us up perfectly. Mm. Well, he's a full-time midfielder now. Yep. Yeah, yep. I think the... They had the article out the other day, and um, yeah, he's up there, I think, 80 to 90% midfield time, always starting in the middle. So I think, obviously, having Tommy Mitchell out there has helped to go his game significantly. The load isn't on him to actually win the ball straight out of the middle for us. He's able to be that next guy out to then feed it on to the runners coming through. So, yeah, like I said, in the last couple of weeks, I think he's having an exceptional season, and like you were just saying, Nico, um, doing it in a way that's flying under the radar without the pressure being all upon him. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let's get to the game itself, boys, because that first half pretty much was the base of the victory. Ten goals to four, uh, five goals in, either, in both the first and second terms. And then we knew that they were going to come at us in that second half mm. and throw everything they could. But we absorbed that pressure particularly well. And I think we've been so impressed with our frenetic style of football and our want to always attack and attack. But I think we had a perfect balance between slow and fast football. We were clearly getting ahead of him on the transition. But there were times where holding possession in that defensive half was crucial as well mm. because while Carlton may have thought that they were backtracking well, it was just more our ability to take time off the clock, slow the game down, bring that control back into our favour. And the Blues didn't really have an answer as a result. No, they were really struggling with the tempo of the game. I felt our coaching staff, again, doing an amazing job. And just the players looking like they're playing natural system without really having to think too hard about it. Mm. I thought our 
intent around the source was fantastic, particularly in the first half. And even when the Blues looked to try and get an ascendancy, you know, Cripps finally showing up in the third term. Did he play? And, and, and Chera oh, and Walsh. No, he was fighting with the coach on the bench. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> but I thought that even when they tried to swing the momentum, we mm. still just found a way to make it a stoppage game, dead rubbers, and that really halted their moves forward. So Harry and Charlie just could not get on the end of enough opportunities and, and Darcy Moore had a big say in that but still think that our, our centre uh, work was very good despite losing the clearances, Jack? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think the game was almost defined up by one passage of play, Nico, where the Blues really did come in that third quarter and uh, the stadium would have uh, erupted if uh, Charlie Kerner had a slotted that goal from 50 out and then mm. the kick-in comes to one Bobby Hill on a half-back flank mm. and he runs the length of the field um, and we're able to get a shot on goal, albeit a very difficult one and Checkers was able to go back and nail it and so, uh, sort of just again sums up the whole game. Carlton were coming, coming hard, and it only took us one opportunity to, uh, yeah, to put another nail in the coffin. Yeah, well, we scored heaps from turnover. I think it was over forty points at one point. Four goals from Chain starting in our defensive half as well, um, which is four of those ten goals in the first half mm. coming from that back fifty. Just says so much, not about the way we've been playing, but how much we can exploit teams by playing in this fashion, Luke. It's just it's incredible to witness, and mm. it's a side that. Are all pretty much in the one mindset when it comes to those points in the game. Yeah, and I I, I know the second half was a bit of a, a struggle to kind of get through. Like we we obviously enjoy the win, but the first half was so exciting, and we're just flashy plays, Bobby Hills and Ash Johnson Speckies, and we're just on fire. But I I read a quote from Adam Kingsley speaking about Collingwood last week, and said they're they're the to- they're the type of side that have learnt how to stop opposition with their momentum and they're probably the best at it at the Mm. moment so heading into that second half you knew the blues were going to come and they literally had the ascendancy for most of that third quarter and they couldn't put it on the scoreboard and we just were able to like you said stoppage game slow it right down stop the scoring pretty much for both sides Mm. and by the start of the fourth quarter the game was over there Mm. there was no way back for them so and you look at their inaccuracy in front of goal but that didn't come from luck that came from us forcing them out wide Mm. with their set shots on goal or having to have rush kicks towards the goal line to try get any score or even rush behinds to a certain point. I think they had five in the end. So it's that pressure, it's that ability to win control of the contest when necessary. It was, again, a case where I think both sides finished on the same amount of tackles, but our tackles inside 50 were higher and that shouldn't be happening to a side that was five goals up mm. at half time. The pressure should be all on them to try and win the ball back. But yet again, it's just us and our ability and just our want for the football Um, It's exceptional. Yeah, we just looked like we knew what to do at the right time and the Blues looked a bit spooked and as if they wanted to regain control of the match, but Mm. we were the big boys on the day (laughs) and they were just pretending to be the big boys, so another great win. Yeah, efficiency in front of goal I thought was pretty important and especially in that first half, I think it was critical. We ended up finishing nine goals, four from set shots and I know that Mm. that's been a vain in our game at times, but for us to have been able to deliver in front of the big sticks was pretty crucial. My check again with four majors and thought he might have been trekking towards yes. another career He's high, maybe getting, to six, at one point, <laughs> getting the six or more. But um, <laughs> look, Checkers was critical leading the way inside mm. 50 again and not only allowing him to get in, um, get himself on the score sheet, but allowing his other forward to do so as well. Yeah, absolutely. He's, yeah, I can't. We can't see his praises high enough. What he's... He, what he does, I think he finished only finished with the nine touches, Nico, for the game, and four of those end up being goals. But it's what he's mm. doing off the ball, to, as you said, create space for the likes of Ash Johnson. You know, Jamie Elliott found himself in space mm. over the course of the weekend. You know, albeit from a, a really, really good kick from mm. Pendles, Mason Cox. Um, that doesn't come from um, acts of blocks and whatnot from mm. the likes of Brody Mychek and Ash Johnson. So yeah, exceptional. Or well, putting his body on the line and forming those packs to either take the mark or bring it to ground. You, you're never going to have checkers lose that in the, the marking contest. So, yeah, critical by him. And I thought, yeah, he was on his way to five or six. But, yeah. Just on the forward line, I think all forwards kick at least one goal in this match from memory, which is wonderful to see the spread. We get close to 10 goal kickers mm, correct. once more. And just wanted to stop and talk about the return of Darcy Cameron. I thought he was huge in allowing checkers to exploit his full talents because ash johnson is there as a second tall ish forward that 
frees up our forward line, really, and the way guys present at the ball. So Darcy Cameron, I just want to focus in on his battle with Jack Silvani and the fact mm. that we were just able to take yeah, them know, to the clean. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, I did just say Jack Silvani. Because um, it was really the start of that second term where we just got a run on and mm. the, the centre clearance work was outstanding, but only because they had a midget in the ruck. So <laughs> thank you, Carlton. Yeah, no, you're right. And look, you know, we saw that Darcy Cameron was potentially going to be the sub leading up and he mm. was in, ended up getting um, a spot in the starting 22. We weren't going to expect the world from him anyway, especially from a statistical point of view, but you're right, Marcus, just his ability to even out the contest in the ruck, especially at times when we needed him and allowed Cox to rest either on the bench or up forward and we saw how crucial that was at times when we had him inside 50 taking marks. Um, yeah, it was nice. To, it was a perfect game for Darcy Cameron to come back to, I think, and that will help his confidence, I'm sure. And, and with a full game under his belt, um, I'm sure he can attack the rest of the season. Touchwood with no more injuries mm. um, to get back to the best that we saw him early in the season, Jack. It just once again proves, Nico, that despite even if players don't take the world by storm with the way they're playing individually, how important that can be just from a structural point of view. So, yeah, mm. highlighted perfectly. Mm. And it's only going to improve the more games he gets back into himself. He had 76 minutes on the ground, so that's obviously going to increase mm. as the weeks go along. But I think, it, like you boys have said, it helps Cox, it helps Johnson, it helps Majacek, um, so it helps everyone. We'll talk about him later on in Ask Pies Nation, but still Sidebottom had a terrific first yep. half, and he looked as though he was on his way to a good 30-plus disposal game, even though that didn't eventuate. It was that work he did in the first half that was so crucial. His tackling, his ability to, again, win the ball out on the wing and be that middleman between plays, setting up inside 50 entries. Um, he was just doing it all, and it was like he had only played 50 or 100 games only a couple of weeks ago. He's on the verge of 300, and mm. we're just so lucky to have someone like him. We'll talk about him in greater detail later, but in terms of his actual game on Sunday, um, I thought he was just a crucial player in those early stages to build that momentum. Yeah, Steele and Pendle's enormous yeah. early in the match, and once again, we talk about the maturity of the season blossoming before our very eyes. The fact that these guys are the ones who are going into big matches and making sure they get their hands on the pill early mm. it has been missing in recent seasons, so can't put into words what Fly has been able to do to reinvigorate these guys because they're still going through the middle. And, I mean, Steele was a magnet early on in the game. So that, that for me, was a huge component of why we were able to get on top early. And you mentioned Pendles. His first quarter was 12 disposals, four tackles, two clearances, three inside 50s, and probably a goal had he not have oh, yeah. uh, missed his set shot. I, I but... caught he'd miss it. Like, He's not a good set <laughs> and shot And almost a goal assist for <laughs> Cranor as well. Exactly right. So, you know, again... Scott Pendlebury didn't end up with 30 plus. He, I think he, mm. I don't think he hit 20 or barely hit it. But that was besides the point. It was that a mountain of work that he did in the first term that helped mm. set up the players around him to get involved in the game. It was, yeah, awesome. Yep. Speaking of setting up players around you, Nick Dacos, I also thought, had an immense first half, gents. I don't know if Carlton put um, any time into him. I know Voss came after the um, game Kano. and said that they, they tried to, but it clearly <laughs> didn't work, especially in the first half. I thought he was absolutely everywhere um, on the end of our handball kicking chains and, yeah, delivering once again. Were they again. going after Josh or was it just Josh backing Nick up again? Or I could, Tarzan. Was getting, <laughs> but I was getting confused on why Josh was copying all all the, it was like they got confused who was Nick and who was Josh. Or It was so good to see, even again, watching the KO Mini, Josh in and amongst every single one of those spot fires with the it. biggest <laughs> grin on his face ever. Just absolutely loving it and oh, giving man. it to Matt Owies, which we love as well. Oh, Owies, don't get me started <laughs> on Owies. Buzz Lightyear. Um, the other one that I, I loved was um, Braden Maynard flying the flag in the course, third. Yeah. Yeah. With Charlie Kuhn, yeah. I think he gave Johnny Noble the slightest of touches and <laughs> off goes Maynard <laughs> like a firecracker. So the uh, Ponsford stand was up and alive for that yeah. one. Geez, they're a basket case of a club. Anyway. <laughs> um, let's speak on Josh Dacos. I thought he was exceptional once again, mm. particularly on that wing. And top on or off, he was <laughs> able to deliver in spades once again. He's putting on a fantastic season and another one of those players that necess aren't necessarily flying under the radar too much, but enough that... We are talking about many other players before him, yet he's continuing to deliver every week. And you caught it at the start of the year, Marcus, that this would be the year he would stand up and 
So far, 10 rounds in, he's absolutely doing that. Well, I think he's benefiting from his brother always uh, <laughs> having a keen eye out for him, Nico. No, I kid. He's playing that wing beautifully, the way Runs that he everywhere. just knows where to be at the right time. I'm not sure if he's done any work with steel side bottom on how to really mm. exploit his time, keeping the ground nice and wide for us. But when those outside players who are so good with ball in hand consistently find the pill and are playing particularly between the arcs, they add so much value in our ability to exploit the fat side. So Josh goes for strength to strength. I still think he can finish top three in the Copeland. I really do, based on the season he's putting mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. But um, he's got his work cut out mainly due to his brother and, and <laughs> Jody Degoe, so keep going. What did you think of Josh Dacos' game? No, I thought, I thought he was immense again, and like we've spoken about, he's... Another one that's just flying under the radar just a little because of the other big names that are absolutely going bananas for us at the moment. But yeah, another fantastic game. 27 disposals, 18 of them kicks, four tackles, nine marks. And like mm. we were saying, he's just everywhere, you know, where you want him to be and uses the ball incredibly well. Can I get your thoughts on Will Hoskin Elliott's last month of football? Because um, we haven't really... His best month of footy yeah, is career. <laughs> we haven't really spoken about it because there's been times we've been critical, particularly in the first half or the first couple of mm. games of the season, but credit where credit is due at the moment. He's playing like a player that is n has no questions about being in his best 22 right now. What, mm. have, what have you made of his performances recently? It's funny you ask. We were actually in the bar yesterday having a yarn <laughs> about a couple of players, and this is this is true when your team's winning. There is a, there is a halo effect. So guys who are perhaps not hitting their usual KPIs in terms of possession, possessions or impact naturally look better when your team is winning. Mm. And that's that's sometimes a good thing too because your system stacks up mm. and you don't rely on all of these perhaps fringe players to really get the job done. We've, we've spoken about Oleg Markov and, and how he's going recently. But Jack, do you want to get to the, the essence of what we were speaking to with, with, with Hoskin over the last four to six weeks? Yeah, look, I think for me, it's the the great trouble at the start of the year was everyone was saying if Lipinski was in, he wouldn't be playing. Mm. But now it comes to a point now where you have, if you're matching up the two, I'm taking Will Hoskin Elliott's marking ability. I think his ability to cross the ground across the four quarters recently. Again, we took halo effect, but he seems to be a, a lot everywhere. I, I, I tend to agree with Marcus. There's, he's not alone either, and you do need these players in your side, absolutely. I mean, shout out Bradley Hill. But you, you got, you've got to... I don't know, it's such a tough one for mine. Yeah. I, I'm having him in over Lipinski at the, at the right moment. Right now. Right now at the moment, because I just feel attributes such as his marking and his ability to be everywhere just pips Lippers um, probably position more than anything because Lipinski is fighting against blokes. Well, like they're kind of a, yeah, different Dugowie, kind of players Mitchell, in the side, and uh, Hoskin yeah. Elliott's obviously bringing a lot of different capabilities than Pat Lipinski is going to bring into the side, and it's his defensive work as well. He's run defensively, um, and that was highlighted. I think it was in the Giants game, or maybe the week before, when he had those three or four late efforts um, in a row. So. I'm in the, I'm, this is my point no, of view. No, I disagree. <laughs> my point of view on our current side is there's no one there right now you can take out no matter what, Agreed. unless things start to go a bit pear-shaped in a few weeks. Um, but guys like Markov's, Hoskin Elliott's, those kind of fringe guys that you're going, oh no, we'll bring Howe in or we'll bring this guy yeah. in to replace them. But if in a month's time we still haven't lost since the mm. Brisbane game, we're still playing well and these guys are still contributing exceedingly well, mm. you can't pull these guys out and change what's working. If it ain't broken, exactly. Don't fix and it. until it starts to break a little and there's guys or injuries that happen, I just I don't see a reason to change anything right now. Yeah, I think at the opposite end for that, I will make a controversial call. If Demick stays fit and ready to go, I'm not bringing him in. I'm I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know. I don't. Well, we I haven't spoken for it since probably the last week's pod. But someone said the same thing yesterday. It was. I don't think Dan McStay gets a game for the rest of the year. We look yeah. too the fast. Year. For the rest yeah. of the year. Yeah. Where? How? Where does if if all our big guys stay fit? Frampton. Frampton's Jim? another. Like, where do those two mm. kind of fit in? Anywhere. I think there's a way. There is a way. There has to be. There'll be a way. But <laughs> no. But it's it's seriously between round thirteen and round eighteen all things being equal, no other injuries, what sort of positional yeah. changes are you introducing that change the mm. chemistry of the team? And so, if we've won eight or nine in a row, then I'm reluctant to change. So Jeremy Howe doesn't come back? Well, he's another like, <laughs> does he, is he, I don't know what his timeline's like, but does he come back so late that unless someone comes out through injury that Howe kind of slots back in, mm. 
is there does it hurt us to actually bring him in at a later point in the year when a guy like Markov might have played ten games in a row and is match fit, match fit, yeah. um, flying, contributing to the team in in different ways to how in some ways. So I don't know. It's just it's a very good position to be in, but the way we're going, some guys are going to be really unlucky come yeah. the last few rounds and potentially yeah. finals. It's it's an it's always an indicator of a good side yeah. when you're yeah. talking about this. So let's just be very grateful but that you, we can but actually have and, this conversation. And you unlike go Cowton. Back, yeah. But you exactly. go back to 2010 and you think about the guys, if especially when you watch the early highlights of the early games and the guys, the senior guys that we had in the side. That's a very good point. And then you think about the the ones, those guys who actually missed out on playing in the grand final being a chance later in the year. And mm. that's as unlucky and stiff that is for some of like calling all greats that were around in that squad, that's that is like you said, a sign of a premiership capable team. That is a very um, good point that you make. Because Presti, O'Brien, Lockyer, yeah. it's um, a stand in some of the names there that actually uh, missed Jordan out. Russell, no. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't just miss out in the final month; they were missing yeah. out from early from mid season. Yeah, mid season. Mm. So. Um, that's where I sit with that kind of talk about selection. and Yeah, I don't think I'm too keen to play up against Carlton, though, without Billy Friend or Jeremy yeah. Howe in the side next time. So we're going to have them, them about, back again. And it could be a bit of the horses boys, for be courses, good, yeah. depending on who we come up yeah. against. But, yeah, for me right now, I'm not really changing much unless yeah things start yeah. to go a bit. One player that, I don't know, might be a different view, but that could potentially be on the fringe at the moment. Jack Inovan came in as a sub mm. from, um, obviously was in the 22 originally, but was swapped with Darcy Cameron with, in, within the hour before the game started. Came on in the final term. Um, probably could have even rested him for the entire game in the end. We didn't mm. need to use him, but was able to still create one controversial moment, of course, with his non-free kick inside 50. Um, but yeah, maybe Jack is another one. Who knows? I think he's being potentially played as a sub last week due to illness. Was there he anyone was, here that... Was he ill through the, he was Ill through the week? He was Ill yeah. throughout the week, so there was... Yeah, there was but few... I think there was just the coaching tactics of but we're going to play Cameron. Ash was another one, Ash Johnson. Yeah, yeah, because he came he off was, at the end. He was um, missed a training through the week due to illness. Yeah. But I think that the, what I read was that if you have a sniffle, you're not let you're going home. So yep. it sort sort of might be a bit overblown when these guys are oh they're not out in the track. Well, they're fine, but yeah, they've just got a sniffle or two. So, um, but yeah, Ginnivan's another one, and he was, should have been high contact. I, he, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, he didn't I know. duck, didn't bend, didn't he? Didn't do anything. He just picked the ball up. So. Uh, yeah, I know. On his selection, though, Nico, I mean, we just spoke about it then about how, how much of a headache it is. With Cameron coming in, um, albeit, you know, Ash Johnson was able to get up for the game, it makes the most sense to potentially bring a bloke like Jack Ginnivan as the sub or a Bobby Hill that we've seen um, in previous games to get Cameron in the side from a structural point mm. of view. So I think it was just a bit unlucky. Reef probably unlucky as well, being one of those mm. those fringe players not allowed to play his super sub role that we've seen him do across the first half of the year so far. But, yeah. It's just a bit of a structural thing. I think it made the most sense to bring someone like a Ginnivan as a sub to allow Cameron to play a full game. You do wonder what would have happened if there was VFL over the weekend, if Cameron yep. had have potentially been playing mm. in a VFL game instead of putting him in the senior side or mm. or if there was another different you know, structural option. I didn't think about that. So that makes it even his, his rehab and mm. credit to the high-performance team and how mm. he was prepared to come back into the side and... and it didn't look like he'd missed, to be honest. No. He was mm. straight back in. So yep. big back of that half of the year for Darcy Cameron. Let's get to the votes then, boys. Um, it might be difficult to pick your two and ones here. I think the threes were all pretty <laughs> self-explanatory. Jack? Yeah, given one to Josh Dacos uh, for reasons highlighted already. Um, was able to get on the end of a goal, albeit from a 50-metre penalty. Um, but no, I thought he was exceptional right throughout the four quarters. Brody Majacek, four goals on to, once again. It almost looked like we were looking for him again in the last like five minutes or so. <laughs> he just wasn't able to um, clunk them. And yeah, three for Darcy Moore. I don't really need to say much more on that, Lukey. Yeah, one for, I should note in there, it's Josh Dacos got the one vote for me. Again, we spoke earlier on him. Two votes, Johnny Noble. Um, um, yeah, another another exceptional game from Nobes and the three votes, uh, <laughs> give me more. <laughs> we love the give me more. <laughs> a couple of stiff uh, mentions. Steele, I thought he was setting the tone mm -hmm. very well early. Josh Dacos, a.k.a. Tarzan, and um, also Ash Johnson for his mark. Also <laughs> just wanted to note, um, I wanted to bring this up earlier, Bobby Hill and Ash Johnson kicked our first two goals of the day for Sergio 
Doug Nichols mm. Indigenous Round. So mm. I just uh, when Incredible. that happened, I know there was some good mm. energy happening there. Yeah. And so um, yeah, well done to those guys. One vote I did go with Darcy Gammon for reasons I just explained. I thought he was exceptional in that second term. Two votes to the big check and three votes to the man on my jumper. Give me more, Nico. Which you can get, Nico, at all our good advice. He's learnt well. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yes, get on social media. You'll be able to find all the links to the website there. Lugie's been tagging it as well. Plus, we got some nice steel merch, which we'll get to very yes, shortly, yep. too. Lead up to his massive 300. Um, votes were pretty much the same. My check, I gave one for his four goals. Josh Dacos, one of his best games of the season, I felt, gets the two, but no one was topping Darcy Moore. At three, as we always do with Sunday games, we give the fans a bit more time to get their votes in. So get those final ones in. I reckon Nick Dacos' spot at the top starting to get a bit dicey. He's literally fallen into that. He's not getting any more votes unless he has 50 and five <laughs> goals. I'd, well, even yesterday, we, we've barely spoken about him. And he was, yeah, you might have said he was really good, but he was really good. He was doing everything like no, normal, but yeah. He was. Um, I can tell you though, at the moment that 90% of the fan votes at the moment, three of those have gone to Darcy Moore, as you would expect, mm. but pretty even across the board. So keep an eye out for our social media posts about what that vote tally looks like at the end of the round. But we've got a nice big Ask Pies Nation coming up, plus our Guest the Crowd competition winner on the other side will be right back. Welcome back to the Pies Nation podcast where the pies are hot and the drinks are cold. Let's get straight into Ask Pies Nation, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, TikTok, whatever. We are there and we're killing it. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's get on to Ask Pies Nation. It's all about one man this week. Although, first of all, we get to, before we get to steal, let's give a shout out to a man who was sitting here only a few weeks ago in Mason Cox. Game number 100 for him. An incredible achievement considering all the hurdles he's had to face in his career so far. And it's awesome to see him get to that milestone, boys. Yep. To think this bloke didn't know what AFL football was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Nico is just remarkable. And he's doing it on the biggest stage of them all in front of the biggest army of them all week in, week out. And, yep. you know, we're going to look back once Mason retires and we're going to look back at some of the big games he was able to have a big impact in. And we're going to really sing his praises, which is a shame because it should have been done at the time. Um, I think a lot of people have been probably extraordinarily harsh on him maybe fair so at times but no, he's had an extraordinary career it was an amazing effort to even play one game so the fact that he's even um, played 100 mm. yeah blows mm. my well, mind to play at the top level for anyone is just an incredible effort yeah. and for him I don't think even if he only played 5 to 10 games it was an incredible effort yeah. so to play 100 and I would say he's in career best form right now yeah. so he's getting better every single week unfortunately as good as that Richmond prelim was I think it hurt him for a while because everyone expected that every week but he's starting to get back to that consistently yep. every week so shout out to Coxie and uh, hopefully, hopefully he's got a few more big ones to come no doubt and just loved seeing the way he was using his body and just like putting the ball with one mitt in front of him and then gloving it mm. that's almost becoming a new technique mm. uh, I guess yeah Progression for him, which we welcome here at the Pies well, Nation podcast. When Kerno was getting holding, holding free oh, kicks. Oh, yeah. So then that, I think the one you're talking about, Cox, and I'm like, see, he only needs one hand yeah. to do it because how does he not I get a free? Oh, he's, he's only able to get one hand up, so clearly he's being held, um, but he still marked the ball. And I said, see, well, we don't need the free kicks. So we can do it ourselves. Exactly. Um, Shout out to Coxy, but it is about another man who's been – in the black and white for many, many years, he's playing his 300th game on Sunday at our home ground of Marvel Stadium. <laughs> um, still side bottom. What a privilege it's been to have this man running out for this club for so many years, as I mentioned. So we asked the fans about their favourite steal moment. I want to get one from the four of us before we move on to the fans and I'm intrigued to get your answers. I might start with you, Marcus. Thanks, Nico. I'm going one from just on the weekend, which made me laugh <laughs> so much. When he went up, when Steele went up for that, what we thought was going to be a mark, and he had the Carlton bloke running front on at him, which again wasn't a free kick, but shouldn't have been. And he punched the ball. Mm. You go back and watch the vision. He does like a flip in mid air, lands on his back, and he's still smiling. There, was, there is a there is a comment saying the same thing. For, right, really? For the yeah, and I was just yeah. like this. It, that, but seriously, it, with Steele. He has always had a grin on his face, no matter mm. whether we're losing, winning. He's just the type of guy you want around at your footy club. Mm. And to see him come into the league, I think everyone was so excited with the 
30 plus disposal game and the 10 goals off the back of his tack cup. But I just remember him and Beamsy early on in, in those sort of 29, 2010 days, just they, they were keeping other blokes out of the team who'd mm. been there for many, many more years. So it's just been a privilege to see Steele mature into really a leader of the club and, and, a, and a stalwart of, of the football team for such a long time. Lukey? Yeah, one of my favourite players and kind of us all being similar age, um, one that we've kind of got to grow up with from the start of his career to where he is now and sort of live all of that with him. So, um, yeah, just have loved the way he's gone about it. I'd say the how many O's in smooth would be right up there with probably commentary moments as well. I think Dennis Committee, it was against North Melbourne. Um, but, yeah, one of a sort of goal that some steal up. He can just do the magical uh, sometimes. So, yeah, yeah love Steelo. Mine's a bit of an obscure one. It came in a game we just spoke about, the 2018 prelim, where Mason tore it apart. He had a great game right across the four quarters there. Mm. But there was a moment where Jack, it was Jack Chris' first goal, and he goes to go the quick handball over the top, but delays it about a second. Mm. And because he saw the play unfold before anyone else did and was able to put it in front of Chris, who goes on to kick a goal. It's just that little moment. It's it's like, yeah, he's this bloke's a genuine football and a couple of really good goals over the creek. A uh, really good one on Anzac Day in 2019, Nico, that sort of bent in the air like a shame on leg spinner bends <laughs> off the pitch. So, yeah, no, that was good. That 2018 year, that still side bottom hat, so close to winning the brow like mm. we were all just begging. And then mm. the guy that ends up winning it is now playing for us. Could you believe that? Yeah. Mm. Tom Mitchell. Um, too hard to pick for a steel side on a moment, but I went with the uh, parting the seas goal against the Saints in 2019. Mm. Um, just incredible. And Dwayne Russell's commentary in that game mm. was pretty awesome too. So uh, that was a nice little touch and just showed how impressive and talented steel side bottom is. He's always got... I remember early days, he had those famous goals from the goal square. You'd always just find him lurking around that area. Anzac Day, I seem right to remember, <laughs> <laughs> about three yes. over the back. 2014 when we the, were... That's, yeah. Yeah. that's the one I'm thinking come of. Back. Yeah, 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 come yeah. back, he was yeah, three in the second Joe quarter. The goose. So. Yeah. Shout out to Steele. Let's get some favourite moments from the fans with Ask Buyers Nation, Lukey. Yeah, so Magpie Liffey, his smile, he looks like he's living his best life and loving every minute. It's why he's so consistently good. He and Pendles are marvels. Yeah, it's it's incredible that we're going to see, I think he will be the fourth or fifth person to play 300 plus games for Collingwood. Mm, Two mm. of them in Pendles and Steel have happened in our generation. Just absurd. And they, they've got plenty more to come, both yes. of them still. So, uh, Sean Campbell, and this is the Marcus, what you just mentioned, Joey plays with it every year, every week, and every possession. On the weekend, he fell on his head with a smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So that's, that's very good. Awesome. Uh, Nathan Forster, coming to Collingwood is the best memory. So, that is memory. <laughs> yeah. He came on the scene pretty quickly. 09 was his debut mm. year at the club. Mm. And yeah, as, as you mentioned, I think it was you, Luke, that said he kept players out of the side pretty much immediately just with his presence mm. inside 50 and eventually in the midfield. Uh, Paddy's Pies, last goal of the game in 2010, right in front of us, mm. embracing Hito. The flag was ours, smiles all round. Yes, unreal. Two goals that day he kicked. Yeah, had a pretty. I think there is a comment referring to the grand finals, and I'll get to that. Uh, Rare Pies twenty. T- uh, this is from Joe Lib. Rare Pies twenty ten Premiership player along with Pendles. I think are the only two still playing. Should become a dual Premiership player this year. Correct. They are the <laughs> only two. Both of those statements are correct. He will be a dual Premiership oh, player. Well, let's hope so. Um, yes, they're the only two. I think. For the last couple of years, have been the only two. So, yeah, mm. great to see. Uh, Ross Katzembanis, 2009 clear BOG against Adelaide. Just a terrific all-round game in such a close final from a first-year player. He's just been a consistent player, which in week in, week, in, week out for 15 years now. That final brought a lot of players up to the forefront. I think mm. Lee Brown had some moments in that game. Britt McCaffrey did. Still side bottom as well. Outstanding. Uh, Sean Lewinardis, seeing him kick 10 in the TAC Cup Grand Final and shoot up the draft boards, only for him to still land with us at pick 11. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was a slider after that performance, so I'll <laughs> stoked, stoked to get him. Uh, Joe Leithhead, absolute jet, a consistent jet at that too. Hopefully gets another flag this year. Uh, Stuart Clark, would love to see a highlights reel of left and right kicks, best on either side in the competition. Yeah, what an incredible talent that is, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. It's alluded to the goal. I was trying to get off my tongue before there, Nico, in 2019. That was off his right boot. So, yeah, mm. exceptional on both sides, old steel. Uh, and he normally, he is a right footer, but he'll normally set shot it with the left. So, oh. he's, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm having a shock at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Bloody Mongrel. <laughs> 
Good name. Uh, hearing for the first time we had a new kid called Steel Sidem was hilarious. Parallel bum is a legend of the club. <laughs> <laughs> Gee whiz. Okay. I'm sure it'd be rapid, rusty or, or stainless is how I know him. But yeah. Parallel bum. There you go. Uh, Irvin, uh, the, the how many O's in smooth goal against North in 2016. It was a dreadful game overall, but that goal was outstanding with the commentary to match it. Bring back Dennis Committee. Mm, true. That was uh, an exceptional moment. Uh, John Caxos, the smartest footballer, dual-sided combo in the comp, and I think we should rest him for two weeks and celebrate his 300th at a full house MCG on King's birthday. Wouldn't put it past Fly to use that as a motivational tool on the day. Gee. Mm. Eh, not bad, but you know what? The, as we were mentioning before, the problem with Steele is that we've been playing that well at the moment that he missing two weeks. He <laughs> might not get, get back, back in. in. <laughs> and we got merch. And we got merch. <laughs> yes. Well, we can, a few weeks to sell it. So. Get on board. Uh, Jake Robinson, 19, uh, 2010, five snags against North. Rusty has been one of my favorite players since he debuted in 2009. And you cannot forget his 2010 grand final and replay. If the Norm Smith was over two games, he would have won it. Mm, yeah, cool. he was huge. Well, hearing that, he's got a good record against North, so maybe mm. we should keep him in and get him a nice big bag to finish off. And I didn't realize that was the last one I had saved. So <laughs> that is it for Ask Pies Nation. Smooth are always there. How many O's in Smooth? <laughs> Ask Fires Nation, get involved on all our social media channels. As always, look out for the question each week following our match. And you can get involved just like you can with guessing the margin and guessing the crowd. So first with the margin, Lukey, yes, 28 just... points in the end. I'll just keep bluffing my way until you get that page yep, up. Got him. Uh, <laughs> uh, 28 points to find a margin. How many do we get correct yeah, from our fans? a few actually. Uh, Brandon Mamedi, Pies by 28 points. Brad Fowles, 91, 28. Uh, Tarkin Bishop as well, Pies by 28. Grace Pierce, 28. Liv Stanley, 18. Pies by 28. Butcher Chris, Pies by 28. Sean Campbell, who we just read out in Ask Pies Nation. Yeah, that's by 28. Teenage Papi, 28. Uh, so quite a few, that's it. Very nice. So, Great yeah. to see. Great to see there was optimism that we weren't going to win by under a goal. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was pretty, uh, most people were pretty confident with their margins this week. It was sort of that 20 to kind of 40 range uh, most people fared in. So yeah. Let's get to, I guess, the crowd core as we seamlessly put our headphones on. As we mentioned off the top, 80,000. <clears> Would have been a lot more if it had been our home game. Did can we you, have many close? Can you? N no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, it was a very predominantly 90K plus predictions yep. for this week. Um, and when you couldn't get a ticket three weeks ago, it was supposed to be the biggest game in history. Uh, yeah, bit disappointing uh, for 80,000, I thought. It should have easily been 90,000. You can oh. rest assured of that event. Beating Brisbane and Bulldogs, there would have been 95,000 mm. people in the Or if they were in the top eight, yeah, yeah. I reckon. Or if they were any good in general. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're going to speak to our guest of crowd competition winner for this week. It's Scott. How far off was he roughly? He do you remember? was 81,000. Oh, okay. And it was 83, yeah. 4, I think. Not many were close. So he was close enough. Not a bad guess. So let's hear from Scott now to see what he has to say following our big win. Scott, it's Nick here from the Pies Nation podcast, mate. How are you going? Good. How are you? Good to hear you, mate. Congratulations on being our guest of crowd competition winner for this week. First question that I have to ask you, were you there at the G yesterday watching us once again break those blues hearts? No, oh, mate, I was spewing. I actually couldn't make it. I had a family thing on and I couldn't make it last week for Mother's Day, so I'm hanging to go. No, You're definitely enough. going to uh, still 300th and Coxie's 100th, though. Awesome to hear, Scott. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on, mate. Jack here. Um, your crowd prediction, mate, you've got yourself on the podcast. Let me know, what, how would did, how did you come up with that number? Did you forecast that the Blues fans weren't going to show up because they've been so deplorable over the past <laughs> month or so? Or course, what was your thought? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, no, I knew they wouldn't turn up, mate. Um, you know, I thought probably about three-quarter time there would have been about half that amount there. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I knew two of them wouldn't turn up if 
bad nine five easy, but um, yeah, you know what they're like, mate. Yeah, fair weather supporters, Lukey. Well, you played the odds because the odds. everyone was going ninety k plus, and you were one of the only ones close to sort of low eighties. So you had a better chance than most. Thanks for coming on, Scott. It's Luke here, and thanks for thanks, um, thanks for sending through the screenshot to help me out a bit because it is <laughs> oh, yeah. a it is a bit of a tough job uh, going through <laughs> yeah, all those yeah. comments, and it's not just Instagram; it's Twitter as well. So, oh, thank, no doubt. Thanks for that. On the topic of still side side bottom, we're just speaking uh, ourselves about um, memories and sort of the best moments of Steele's career. Is there any that's sort of sit in the top of your head as a memorable moment of Steele's? Well, there's a few. It's probably that first season and just coming out of nowhere. I mean, he kicked, uh, what was it, 10 in that grand final in the under-18s. And mm. finally, we got uh, we, we sort of didn't have the best luck with um, first round picks for a while there. And his first year, he's come on, made a massive impact and, you know, kicking snags in the granny. It was bloody brilliant. Loved him. Mm. G'day, Scott. Marcus here. Just coming back to the Blues, we're having a bit of a, a sesh here, enjoying how much we <laughs> pummeled them by. And I just needed to know, you've got Richmond, you've got Essendon, you've got Carlton. Who's your most hated team out of the three? <laughs> no, it's got to be uh, definitely Carlton. And I'd say followed by yeah, hey, probably Richmond. <laughs> but Carlton, just, it's just bred into me, mate. That's just, like, I don't know. I've got two of my best mates at Carlton. And, I can't even be happy for them if they win. I, just, <laughs> I don't have I, I don't have it in me. It just doesn't. It's just yeah. I'm just so one eyed I guess. And a me- um, and a message to those friends on off the back of the win. <laughs> no, I'm not the type to rub it in. Uh, <laughs> I hear this, but you know why? Because I don't want to get it back. I can't take it, mate. I'm really just like that, so. Love the I'll honesty. I'll try not to give it out too much, mate. I'll just like the only time I would give it out is if we actually want to flag, but. Till then, I'll just keep pretty quiet. Good man. The lid stays on. We'll we'll do it on your behalf, Scott. Don't worry. No Um, worries. (laughs) Thanks, boys. Um, Tell us a bit about your journey to becoming a Pies fan. We always love to hear the personal stories that come from supporting this club. How long have you been um, a fan of the black and white? And yeah, tell us some of your your favourite moments along the way. Um, I guess I was, yeah, since I was born. So I'm 35. Australian is about 10. I uh, went to school, had to pick a team. He was a Juventus fan, so. <laughs> nice. You might have just cut out there for a sec, sec Scotty. You might have to start again if you could. Yeah, I'm not man to tell you. No, we might have to um, stop that for a sec. He's got the old black and white because he was a Juventus fan when he got to school. and. Yep. <laughs> no. We might have to check your reception there, Scotty, mate. We're just having a bit of trouble cutting you in and out. Sounds so. like a good story. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I'm shattered. <laughs> <laughs> maybe try, maybe try one more time yeah, if you can. Bank, mate. One second. Maybe if you, yeah, you third, third, better there, mate? Yeah, that, no. that's much better. Let's try again. Okay. All right, one more time. Yeah, so me old man, Italian, uh, came to Australia when he was about 10, the black and white when he's gone to school and, uh, yeah, just... He's been a full-blown nuffy since then, mate. So, <laughs> thirty-year-plus member, and uh, you know, level one Ponsford stand, and uh, yeah, I guess I'm following his footsteps as a uh, next-generation nuff, mate. So, yeah, no nah, earliest memory, probably that team in the '90s. They weren't too good, but I, I loved them. I think Paul Paul Williams was my favourite growing oh, up. Yes. Just um, dashing through the midfield, a few <laughs> banging a few goals from fifty, and uh, probably a bit of Sav Rocker, mate, being the Italian influence there. Oh, so, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, mate. Now I sort of um. I moved to Richmond when I was about in about 2013 or 14. And I started going like constantly, and since then now I'm further out in the suburbs. I just yeah, I've got to get my fix every week, mate. <laughs> well, we'll go to. I was going to ask you for your favourite player since you've had that long long time being a supporter, but we'll go to maybe a favourite sort of game. We always like to ask this one, sort of a weird one that it's not the ones that everyone picks, but just one that sort of sticks in your memory bank as a sort of a favorite victory or a favorite moment along your supporter career. Um, yeah, it's not hard to, uh, sort of hard to, uh, the ones that stand out are the ones from last year, like seeing Carl, knocking Carlton out of the finals and just seeing those heart, those hearts break live on TV, you know, it was just, that's probably my favorite ever, you know, it's not that obscure, but yeah, just that moment <laughs> and just, just capturing the heartbreak live on TV, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that just makes us smile every time we hear it, Scott. Great to have you on the pod, mate. Thanks for coming on. Congratulations on being the guest of crowd competition winner, and hopefully we're celebrating long and hard at season's end. Hopefully, boys. Now, nah, thanks for having us on, and uh, you're doing a great thing, mate. It's uh, it's good to listen to a few lads talk about the footy. You know, when you've had a good win, and uh, really lap it up a bit more. So, now, nah, thanks for your thanks for your pod, boys. 
Oh, cheers, cheers Scotty. Good. Much Thank appreciated, you. mate. Thanks, Thanks, Scotty. On you, Scott. All the best, lads. Take it easy. Bye bye. And that was Scott joining us on the Guess the Crowd competition. That could be you if you guess the crowd closest to. Make sure you look out for the social media post in the lead up to the weekend's game. And if you guess closest to the crowd, that will be you joining us as part of the Pies Nation podcast. Nice to get Scotty's thoughts there. Don't mind a fellow Italian and the event of story. It always resonates with me pretty well. So pretty happy with that one. Um, Marcus. Time for your very extensive VFL report this week because I know you're not... drinking from that cup as a camera pans to you. What cup? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I know you've been doing a lot of hard work and research into this one, so get us on the way with the VFL report. No worries, Nico. So by last week and uh, <laughs> we played the ruse before we played the ruse. 11.05 AIA Centre. So uh, why, why are we playing at Marvel? Just, just with the <laughs> I, ones, I don't, by the way. I, I hate it. I hate ho- having played so many home people games are going to miss Steele's 300th game. Mm. The bigger play at Marvel. This one's not too bad. It's later in the year when we play Brisbane, which is a potential sort of grand final, you know, warm up uh, at Marvel. Use <laughs> 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 you, your words, not mine, mate. And well, I, I, <laughs> honestly, Collingwood and Brisbane are the two best sides for me in it right now, um, and <laughs> forecasting very far ahead. But to play that at Marvel uh, is just a it's a joke, and a lot of people will miss out on yeah, that, that night as well. That. It always irritates me how we always seem to play against Marvel home games against teams that have Marvel as their stadium yeah. all the time. So Bulldogs is another one. Mm. I think we always seem to play them. Saints. Um, St. Saint, Kilda, yeah. yeah. No, shocking. Anyway. Um, all right, so North it is this weekend. That's all VFL. I have to say. Thank you very much. All right, let's well, move to the <laughs> VFLW. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> the Pies lost to the second place Southern Saints by five mm. points. Uh, still in third spot, but we've got the Bulldogs um, this weekend and they're second last on the table so hopefully a chance to bounce back in that one um, now this just went nuts last week the weekend headline Marcus I mean you you just oh, I want to know a lot of numbers this week pretty much because you were able to speak Ash Johnson's mark into existence and as we've seen he was able to take one of if not the mark of the year in 2023 so off the back of that what can you provide us for this weekend's game against? North? Are we are we going, we're going headline with, again? Yeah, we're going headline. Okay, it's 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 Steele and Mason, isn't it? Yep. It's hard not to get excited about those two. Oh gosh! You do you want on. us? Do you want us to go back to you then? Let you have I've a got a good one. Go on, Lukey. Well, considering North made seventy-seven interchanges on oh. the weekend, just going. Up, I think Collingwood's going to win by seventy-seven oh. points. <laughs> <laughs> We're not getting ahead of ourselves at all on this podcast. No, nah, seriously, we should smack them. The next two weeks, if we're a genuine team, you know, in this competition, we should smack mm. both the upcoming teams we're going to play so jack over to you yeah, look i've been slow today and there's not much creativity in my <laughs> monday headline um marcus went with mark of the year last week i'm going uh bobby hill to kick goal of the Ooh. year this week yeah i reckon he got it close. a couple of weeks ago yeah just first a, one just a, yeah goal of the round. His goal of the year <laughs> well i said that we would beat carton by 15 goals <laughs> unfortunately didn't quite happen i'm still waiting for the Voss news i'm just checking the um now Again, a pretty tough one to pick, but I had been cheering on for my check to get to six on Sunday and it didn't quite happen mm. for him. He'll kick six plus mm. on Sunday against six the Six plus for checkers. He will continue his career best trajectory and he'll <laughs> get six goals against North Melbourne. All right, Marcus, hit us home. Oh, yeah. Pies by 10 goals. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm feeling very happy with what I did last week. I'm just Doesn't have to do anything. Leave it there. You know? Someone else get one. Oh, you, you apparently got uh, Bobby Hill and his giant day uh, out, wasn't close. it? Close. I had him for three goals. He only got two. But I, he did have a giant day. First goal. And oh, that, we'll count giant it. We'll, we'll giant count first it. half. It's not so. TikTok count worthy, but it's close. <laughs> it it counts. Was, yeah. That's okay. I was nearly there, so we'll get there. Very good. All right. We'll stick to your 10 goal margin. We'll see. Pies by 10 goals. 10 goals. That's fine. All right. Was that it, everyone? Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Great. North. That's all right. North to come. North to come. Steel 300 merch. Steel 300. Get on get board. Get around it. Absolutely. Get, get on Get a shirt. Get a jumper. Get a baby thing. We sell them. Baby one. And get a cup. And a and mug. A cup. And a should cup. we should we speak to this Daycost design that we've got going, Nico? About Why? Because you designed it. The, the idea <laughs> behind it. There might be a little bit of confusion about what's going on. But the what? idea is that Peter Daycost being the tree and the apple doesn't fall far from <laughs> really? the tree. So, yeah, for anyone who was confused about that, just to be clarity. Jack was the one who came up with that one. He was so. all over it. 
We needed something for Dacos, and that's exactly <laughs> what he delivered. Lovely. No, you can get that on our website. You can get it it's on... The first time Marcus has actually really looked <laughs> well, no, at it. Well, no, I just wanted... You, you pointed out, um, Luke, that you would like would have liked those a bit further apart. So <laughs> could you just tell us a little bit more about why that's No, the so case? with... Just with my thing with coffee mugs is if you're going to have something on them, have them at even spots on both sides of the cup. So... That was just... Tarant. Yeah. Oh, there you go. He yeah. set me up for that. So <laughs> <laughs> and it couldn't stop me, but couldn't stop me. they are fantastic cups nonetheless. <laughs> I love my coffee cups. I've got a big collection at home. Uh, try and use a different one every day, and the day cost one is getting a, a fair go at the moment. Well, get on the steel merch, boys. We need to get pump this up as much as we can in the lead up to his 300th game on Sunday, which hopefully will mean we get our seventh win in a row as well. But until next week, Jack, Luke, Marcus, thanks as always. Good on you, boys. Thank you, boys. Good to be you, boys. Thank you. Thank you. I've been your host, Nicholas Sacco. You've been listening to the Pies Nation podcast, where the pies are hot and the drinks are cold.